Let's go back on the record on State versus Ward. Mr. Ward and his attorneys are present. State Attorney's Office is present. Um, ladies and gentlemen who are in the audience, there will be no outburst, no facial expressions being made during closing arguments, nothing that is distracting of any kind. If the deputies see that or I see it, you will be escorted from the courtroom. Thank you. Mr. Jay. Just one thing that was mentioned during closing that I believe needs to be addressed. I don't want to belabor it and take a lot of time with it, um, but the fact that once the BlackBerry was in evidence and was taken out of evidence and given to Mr. Ward so that he could exercise his constitutional right to his attorney was only half brought up. And I thought before we started these proceedings, we weren't bringing that up. Yeah, I was kind of hoping that you hadn't noticed that, but you did, so. I notice things sometimes. Mr. Ward was given his phone because he wanted to communicate with his attorney. And you opened the door, Mr. Gillen. What exactly are you intending on saying about that, Mr. J, of anything? that the Orange County Sheriff's Office was nice enough to help him exercise his constitutional right to call his attorney when he requested. Well, I would uh, disagree with that. They, they, his phone is not the only thing that calls his attorney. Uh, I, I believe that they, when you take something out of evidence as they did and give it to him, that what they were doing and what they did is they sat in there and they listened to him uh, call other people other than his lawyer. They did not take his phone back after he called his attorney. And to make the record appear that, that what happened is he said, let me get my phone, and then he called his attorney and then they took it away is simply not true. My point is, is that it was taken into evidence and then taken out of evidence and given back to him. It was you opened the door. The question is how far did you open the door when you made that statement in closing? The state is allowed, to, that's the whole point of rebuttal, to respond to the arguments that are made by defense. You made a point of the fact that his phone was in evidence and then was taken out of evidence and handed to him as if that were inappropriate. That's your argument and you have every right to make that argument. The question for me is how far that door got opened. Um, Mr. Cromwell wants to talk to you, or he wants to talk to Mr. Braden. Okay, come on up. Um, Mr. J, tell me again, it comes up in the interview, right? In the lengthy interview with the police. Where does the phone conversation come up? Because for some reason I know about it. Right. Where he gets the phone back. Not in this trial. No, 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 no. I meant in real life, not in the trial. This is real life. But I'm saying when he was arrested, the phone was taken into custody. It was on Did the drive. Did he ask for the phone? Yeah, it was on the driveway and was getting packaged right. up out there, and it was requested to be delivered to him, and it was, it was delivered to him. But did Mr. Ward say to the police, I need my phone? That I don't remember, but, I mean, the argument has been made. <laughs> May I respond? I'll give you a minute. Hold on. All right, go ahead. Uh, the, our recollection as a team uh, as to what occurred was he needed the phone number off of his phone to call his lawyer. He didn't need the phone. They have phones there. So that is what happened, number one. And number two, they did not say, fine, call your attorney and take the phone back. They let him go on and on and on. We all know about that. And number three, as it relates to this litigation and this, uh, there was evidence that that uh, the phone was taken from him, put into evidence, and then given to him. That is it in terms of the evidence in this trial. There's nothing other than that. And if uh, if the uh, the state wishes to try to make an argument that's outside the evidence in this case, then we would object to that because that is not. The evidence is, my recollection, the evidence in this case is what I said. My additional recollection is that the reason why he wanted the phone uh, was uh, to get the number for his attorney. They could have gotten that off the BlackBerry. They could have, uh, he could have used their phone, or he could have called uh, his attorney 
and then they take it back from him, which they didn't do. Mr. Gillen, the problem is not what's in evidence here. I ex well, Judge Harris, in granting the 3850, excluded all of this testimony. The state would not have ever been able to bring this up. It would have been a violation of the 3850 ruling, which is law of the case. By making that statement, you you partially open the door. I don't think, I think the better argument that you can make without violating any of Mr. Ward's constitutional rights would be that the sheriffs gave him the phone at his request so okay. he could retrieve a number and leave it at that and move on. That's fine. That's all I want. Right. To and that gives you the opening of the door, but keeps us off of the issue of his attorney. All right. Yes, ma'am. Anything else? No, I'm ready. All right. Um, before we bring the jury back in, I'm going to change the procedure slightly for excusing, excusing the alternates because of the number of alternates we have and what they have back there. Once I get done reading the instructions, I'm going to excuse the alternates in the presence of the other jurors, send them through the jury room to get their things first, and then the deputies will take the jury out to deliberate. So there's going to be a slight change that you all will notice in how I do this. All right, let's bring the jury back in. Stay recognized presence of the jury. Yes, Your Honor. Defense? Yes, Your Honor. Have a seat, everyone. Mr. J, your rebuttal? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, your verdict does need to speak the truth. That's what you're obligated by law to do. You need to speak the truth because Mr. Ward refuses to. His three different stories are completely irreconcilable. His fourth story that just came out during the closing argument is now because Sarah Ward said that in the past, he would get up and walk away from arguments. Now, this fourth story is he did get up and walk away from an argument with Mrs. Ward and got thrown a wine thrown on the back of his shirt. So ladies and gentlemen, let's think about this. If that really happened, and it did, why lie about it? Why tell the world when you do an interview that you accept with Channel 13, I have no idea how that got on my back. Why? Because what he is saying afterwards is not the truth, that there was this accidental struggle, that his wife snuck up behind him. Start with telling the story. Yeah, you know, we had an argument downstairs on the patio. She threw some wine on me. Being the bigger man, I, I walked away 4,000 steps up to the master bedroom. And lo and behold, right behind me is my wife pointing a gun at me. And now there's a struggle. Well, if that's the truth, then say it. The truth never changes. The truth of the matter is that he went upstairs so recently after having that wine thrown on him that it transfers to his pillowcase and to those sheets. That's the truth of the matter. And you can understand that that happened before the discharge of the firearm because he didn't disturb the blood pattern there on the comforter. Remember with Stuart James, who I would submit as the state star witness, and we'll get to that, you know, He's like, well, the comforter could have moved. And I was like, mm, look at that one piece of blood there on the sheets. Oh, yeah, no, the comforter didn't move. Now, a few other points before I get into what I really wanted to do here. She didn't kill him in his sleep. This is not the state of Florida versus Diane Ward. If he is asleep downstairs on the patio after a little bit of day drinking, sleeping it off, and his wife goes all the way upstairs to get that gun. Why not come all the way back downstairs and off him in his sleep? It's a lot easier to kill somebody that's not moving. That didn't happen. Now, I understand that there's a couple of different stairwells and an elevator to get to that master bedroom, but we're not crossing paths. I mean, according to Sarah Ward, that gun is up there. So Mrs. Ward, after throwing the wine and the glass and getting wine on him and the grout, which is hard to get out of the grout. And he walks away and leaves it, of course. Um, there's no crossing of paths. I mean, she just appears like a wraith behind him. And at some point, he's going to have to call the police. So when the defense argues that it was immediately after, I understand that that's what Mr. Ward said in the 911 call, maybe five minutes ago, somewhere in, into the 911 call. 
But that all hinges on his credibility. And, you know, when they were pointing out why, well, you know, the state doesn't want you to listen to anything Mr. Ward says because, you know, he says it's an accident. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if the state of Florida has not proven to you beyond a reasonable doubt that this was not an accident and not self-defense, then you should vote not guilty. But you shouldn't do it based on what Mr. Ward said because under the jury instructions, everything he says should be discounted. I mean, why lie about the wine spill if you, if you accidentally shot your wife? That's, I submit, completely incredible. The Blackberry. The sheriff's office was nice enough to give it to him when he requested it to pull a phone number out. That's not bumbling of evidence. Secrets. Well, is it a secret from Sarah Ward that she has happy pills? Because Sarah Ward talked all about her happy pills. Sarah Ward talked all about you know, her pill usage and whatnot. The point of that testimony with some of those witnesses was nobody recognized her as having this overt mental illness, like, oh my god, Mrs. Ward is depressed. Oh my god, this and that. Yeah, she's on happy pills. Um, not alone. Is the ethanol, the alcohol in red wine, somehow different than in Prosecco, which is, under my belief, a, a white sparkling wine from Italy? Is it different? Is, what's different that makes her behavior different? Alcohol is alcohol. The professor, Professor Davis, here we go. He didn't even get the law that he came to explain to you right. He came here and testified that when a spouse dies in a marriage, her half or his half of the tendency by the entireties goes to her heirs. What? That, that defeats the whole purpose of it. So now a husband or a wife has to split the house with children or whoever the heirs might be, Boston University, whoever you leave your stuff to, that, that's not the law. And that's why the judge has instructed you on the law. There's a law that says you get the right of survivorship. So he's wrong about that. And I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole again too much about the finances, but there was a $7.5 million lawsuit. It was clearly stressing Mrs. Ward out. She, she mentioned it to people, including her doctor. And Mr. Ward was also on antidepressants. So everybody's stressed out about it, so I don't know why we're fighting about what's going to happen. They clearly believe something was going to happen, and that's what matters. Motive. Again, I'm not going to beat this dead horse. There doesn't have to be a motive. Second degree murder is doing something out of anger, ill will, hatred, spite. That's what this case is. There was clearly an argument that Mr. Ward denies happened. He denies it happened. It's not just, I don't know how the wine got spilled on my back. It's, there was no argument downstairs. There was no argument upstairs. I have no idea how this wine got on my back. She just appeared behind me. Why not tell the truth about those things? Because the rest of the story is not true. And the jury instruction says, throw it out. Throw everything he said out. Again, the DNA mixture. You know, had these things not been mixed and her profile doesn't show up, which it didn't, even when it was both. And so logically, if her profile doesn't show up in both, it's not going to show up in either, according to the only person who's actually done PCR testing and, and understands how you call a minor mixture when you do PCR testing. The argument would have been they should have mixed it so that they could try and find a minor profile. So you got to understand that's the argument. It's going to be one way or the other, no matter what the state does. The GSR, he says he shot his wife five times. I just shot my wife. I just shot my wife. And she's there. And we know that the GSR isn't different from the barrel or from the cylinder, so it, it doesn't really mean anything. Now, before Mrs. Ward's nails were clipped, you can see in the photographs they were quite long, yet there's no injuries to Mr. Ward's hands or fingers, which I submit would probably be where the struggle would be occurring over this gun if they're struggling over whose hands are going to be on the gun and control the gun. So when you ask, well, gee, why didn't the state send the DNA for her fingernail clippings? Well, there's no injuries on Mr. Ward, and they do live together, so you would kind of expect his DNA to be around anyways. But what's important, there's no injuries. There's no injuries on her hands. There's no signs of a struggle. 
And so it's very ironic when even the defense struggles or, or, or uh, stresses over and over again, there's no struggle, that they want to argue that there was a struggle over the gun. They argue, yeah, there's no furniture turnover. Yeah, there's no injuries on either one of them except for the gunshot wound, but there was a struggle. The citalopram, again, not worth really talking too much other than saying, again, if it's in your belly or in your bladder, the one place it's not is your blood. And the family. Obviously, nobody wants to believe that your father killed your mother. Nobody wants to believe that your brother-in-law of umpty ump years killed your sister. So I don't know how much weight you should really be giving the notion that they came and testified for Mr. Ward. So let's talk about what doesn't change. The truth doesn't change, but neither does the science. And the science comes from Dr. Anderson, comes from Dr. Stephanie, comes from the state star witness Stuart James that the defense called, and it called, comes from all the people that said that the distance determination was between 12 and 18 inches, Dr. Anderson was nice enough to narrow it down further. All right, so what did Stuart James tell you? Stuart James told you, you can see that there's projected blood on the bedspread. It matches the pattern of projected blood on Mr. Ward's shorts. There's a drip pattern on Mr. Ward's shoe. There's a trail of the drip pattern that leads to underneath Mrs. Ward and then the pool. And then behind, on the wall, there's the projected arterial or heart uh, spurts of blood. Now, through a little deduction and some questioning, we were actually able to talk about what things mean because you see them and what, th what, what uh, doesn't um, appear to be. So he was able to say, and he agreed, that, well, actually, Mr. Ward's shorts would be the start of the projected pattern. Why? Because there's no void, no gap. There's nothing on the left leg of his shorts. There's nothing on the left shoe, but there is on the right shoe. And then again, the projected blood, which is the heartbeat that happened after the temporary cavity closed. And so what happened there? Now, according to Mr. Ward's testimony in the statement to Channel 13, Mrs. Ward comes up behind him as he's at the podium emptying things out of his pocket. The Lord knows where because there's nothing on the podium but a holster and a think pad. 
And if he's ambushed and surprised as he's taking things out of his pocket by a woman right behind him pointing a gun at him, I submit it could be possible that he would drop those things, but certainly there's nothing on the podium or, or the nightstand. That appears to be in contradiction to Stuart James' testimony, who says, based on the projected blood pattern on the shorts, on the bedspread, on the wall, this V, she had to be facing this way with her back to the nightstand. That's what he testified. The defense witness, Stuart James, testified that her back was to the nightstand so that she could project all this blood through her face. Now, what else do we know? Well, he says the drips on the shoe are pretty close, if not 90 degrees. Now, of course, the shoes are leather. They're not a flat, nice surface like glass, steel, tile, or something. So there's some absorption. And remember, he said particular there, there's this long one with the tadpole tail. That's from the height of his foot. But otherwise, it's pretty much a dripping event, some, some little projection. So she's this close, and yet we know the pattern goes back 11 inches on the, the bedspread. The bed's 27 inches high before you add the fluffiness that I cannot seem to replicate today of the bedspread. We can start understanding heights. And we can start understanding where there's not blood and where there is blood. Now, we're running out of real estate here. If you look at the photographs, we're running out of real estate if Mr. Ward is standing. 12 to 18 inches, we're running out of real estate because it's going to drip, it's going to project, it's going to project, but yet it's not going to project here, 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 here. So I would submit what it's consistent with is sitting on a 27-inch bed, which this isn't 27 inches, and he pointed the gun at her and pulled the trigger. She may not have even seen it coming. Her eye might have been open. But you run out of real estate when you start considering everything that we discussed. The force of gravity, that things go in straight lines until they're affected by something else. It's not on his hands. It's not on the gun. Yet it hits his leg. It hits the bed. It goes 11 inches back on the bed. It drips on his shoes. And what else do we know about this bedspread? Underneath it, that sheet in that pillowcase, fresh wine stain transfers. So what did happen? After that argument, no matter which way he went, stairwell A, stairwell B, the elevator, he came up to that bed, got that gun out of the nightstand, if that's where he keeps it according to Sarah Ward, and instead of Lord knows what Diane was going to do. Nobody knows what she's going to do. Nobody knows what he's going to do except for him. And then whether she comes up there to continue the argument, apologize, or somewhere in between, because you, there's no way to know because the only historian of this event has given three stories and now four with the, first, for, with the defense closing. That kind of explains everything. Now, with this firearm, this isn't a very large firearm. If it's in her hand, which is his testimony, because he comes up behind, he's pointing the gun at her, somehow it gets twisted 180 degrees, 12 to 18 inches away, and we have some concern over whether or not she pulled the trigger. The surface area of this trigger is right here. It's smooth, probably no more than a two or three cubic centimeters. And look at the grip of this gun. It's serrated so that you can hold on to it when it fires a 357 cartridge, which is going to put it out at 15 to 1900 feet. I think we heard the, the different testimony. But yet, there's no blood on the gun. So what do we know? It's far enough away, or at least above, to not get blood on it as it hits his shorts, whether he's sitting, whether he's standing, to project 11 inches deep on that bed. 
yet it's not on this gun. So the struggle, really? She's, she's looking down because they're struggling down below the waist. Where's the blood going to go? And remember, Stuart James says, you know her head is upright because after she gets shot, according to Dr. Stephanie and Dr. Anderson, she's dropping. Her arms would be dropping, but yet there's uh, no blood on her left arm from this. The blood on her left arm, according to the, Mr. James, was satellite spatter from her wrist. But her head has to be upright to reject that blood or close to upright. That's what he said. That's the defense witness. But what was happening as she's falling, she's losing vertical height, but still projects that blood. So her head has to be upright to do all that. It's, it's not possible physically or with the testimony to expect there not to be blood projected down on this gun if it's below. There will come a certain point, because you know, you know this gun caused this damage. It's just a little right to left, a little down to up. But it's in front of the wound. No matter if she's up, no matter if she's down, no matter if she's left or right. And it's not there, because it's too far away, or too far above, or both. So we do know what happened. We don't need you know, Dr. Anderson to tell us <laughs> that it happened by the wall. We have Stuart James, the, you know, the blood expert, who tells us, yeah, the beginning of the bloodshed event is Mr. Ward's right shorts, his right shoe. She had to have dripped on it and projected at the same time. And the mechanism of that is veins, venous blood, as the doctor testified, lower pressure. We've all had those cuts you know, that drip and drip and drip. And hopefully none of you all have ever cut an artery, but it's a different experience. And that's projection. And that's projection. And both of those events happen simultaneously. But none of it's on the gun. None of it's on Mr. Ward's hands. And we're running out of real estate if they're standing toe to toe to drip. Because that's what Stuart James said. To drip, it's pretty much 90 degrees. So we're toe to toe. And I don't know if she's still doing this, or if she's apologizing, or if something between. But you run out of real estate unless he's sitting. And the projection, slightly upward, kind of makes sense. So you can piece all this together. There's no guessing. Because Stuart James, Doctors Anderson and Stephanie, and all the people that said 12 to 18 inches or 14 to 18 inches have given you everything you need to know about this case and what happened. Mrs. Ward did not have her hand on this gun when it went off. The DNA from the kickback is going to be right there. And her DNA, as their own expert said, was so low. It's so low. It's so low. And remember, the third person had alleles or DNA on three or four different locations. But that third or fourth person wasn't there at that time. So we know from the DNA. We know from the distance determination. And we know from the blood what happened and where they were. So. How can her back be to the podium, or, or to the nightstand, coming up behind Mr. Ward and do this? Now, if Mr. Gillen had the chance, he would say, oh my, you know, it all happened so fast. They spun around. Well, Mr. Ward didn't say that. He didn't say spinning around. He just, it's in my face. I have to grab the gun really quick. It goes off. I don't know how it went off. And why, why lie, why not? tell the truth about the wine being thrown on your shirt if everything else you say is true. The verdict needs to speak the truth. The truth doesn't change. The science doesn't change. The laws of physics aren't different one day from the next. I'm asking you to return a guilty verdict because that's what the science says and because the only historian of this event has given you way too many versions to be credible. And if you're not going to be credible about what happened, when your wife of 26 years or whatever dies, if you can't be credible about that entire story, why is that person lying? Why? Because he shot her out of anger. And you can be upset about it and wish you'd never done it, and your family members can believe you, but that doesn't change what happened in that room that night. I'm asking you to convict Mr. Ward because the evidence requires it. The evidence has shown beyond a reasonable doubt 
that this is what happened. He is guilty of second-degree murder. Thank you.